considerable scope and, and confidence in building a, a regional network. We cannot sidestep bilateralism to achieve regionalism, which seems uh, rather improbable to do. And we have seen this for several decades. Uh, <clears throat> I think since we have three women, let me just give two quick facts <laughs> to, <laughs> to add uh, value to the whole debate. I think it's very important that women are gaining agencies. If women gain agencies, the chances of turning around the unwritten rules are very strong, right? Also, I think if you bring in women into the workforce at par with what the percentage of men are, then you develop almost a 28 trillion global economy. That's quite fantastic. So I think these are quick thoughts I thought to put forward to start the session off. And let me start with you, uh, Dr. Jikshit, my good friend. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ajay Dikshit. I'm from Nepal. First of all, I would like to thank IDSA and Ambassador Cheno for your uh, invite, and and particularly for you know designing this conference. I think it's a very interesting blending of the macro perspective as well as bringing in the in the micro. And I think there's a lot of thoughts gone into you know organizing and planning this session, and perhaps. I should also, you know, uh, thank you for allowing you know, sort of a, a different kind of a, a warm side perspective, you know, something from down there to come and sort of, you know, expressed in this 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 uh, this platform, this conversation. Uh, you know, everyone in this conference, uh, you know, in the morning talked about climate change. They talked about climate actions. They talked about climate finance. They talked about the climate uh, injustice. Uh, Clearly, climate change brings us two important dimensions. The first is that of mitigation. You know, mitigation is about gas. You know, it's about greenhouse gases. You bring it down, and then of course we talk about adaptation. Adaptation is about water, because the impact of climate change manifests through the water cycle. And of course, after COP twenty seven, the agenda of loss and damage is also now is kind of mainstream. So we have three pillars. Mitigation, adaptation, and loss and damage. Now, what I'm going to do is to, uh, you know, focus on the adaptation part. You know, I have done a lot of work on climate change adaptation in relation to water, floods, disaster. And I'm going to focus on something uh, Dr. Sinas talked about, a kind of a marginalized bilateral issues. I'm going to talk about small rivers in Ganga Basin. And I'm, talk, I'm going to talk about small rivers that flow from Nepal into Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and you know, small part of West Bengal. And then to highlight why these rivers are important, why that these rivers are not in our radar, radar screen. We don't think about them, even though they support through their ecosystem services to large section of population in Nepal, Tarai, as well as in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Uh, this is an area, this is a theme that's uh, not examined, not explored. And this is part of a research that I'm working on. And of course, uh, very little information, knowledge available about these rivers, highly fragmented. So I'm going to talk about these rivers, the challenges. I'm going to show you some photographs because, you know, words, uh, photo speaks better than words. And then I'm going to uh, sort of, you know, list out as a part of this research, what I call five pillars of resilience. The theme of this conference is resilience. What does resilience mean? At what level do we start? Individual, community, business, national governments across the region. So I'm going to present to you five uh, themes, five pillars of resilience as evolved during this study. And finally, I'm going to venture to present to you a guiding philosophy of how how in South Asia we might begin to think about waters differently. You know, let's think about water differently because you know we all drink it. If we don't drink it, we don't survive. And 70% of our blood ourselves is water. So therefore, please look at this and let's make water a mass movement. All right. Okay, how do we move forward?
All right. As I said, you know, the Ganga Basin is all we know. You know, we all resident of the, you know, Ganga Basin, Ganga Plain. I'm in the North Ganga Plain. I live in Nepal. Uh, Ganga starts from, you know, uh, Gangotri in, in Uttarakhand hills. It also has tributaries in, in Nepal. You know, it's the, the, this is the Kosi, this is the Gandak, this is the Karnali, this is the Sarada, the Mahakali. But then also there are the middle hill rivers, you know, big rivers. And there's, there are the small rivers, as you can see. They start in the Siwalik hill in the south. And then what they, we call seasonal rivers, Churi rivers. These are small, these are seasonal, these are flashy. They bring floods. Cumulatively, they bring larger disaster, or larger impact than the larger rivers. But then, as I said, they are not in our radar screen. That we, what we call maybe uh, a marginalized rivers. And then, of course, they flow through some of the you know, most dense population in the region. This is Nepal district, and this is in UP. This is in Bihar. Uh, moving forward, this basins face multi hydrometeorological hazards. Rising heat, cold wave, high winds, extreme rainfall, and droughts. As you can see, you know, high temperature, rainfall, uh, extreme rainfall, and then of course, climate change is making them even more extreme. But we know uh, much less, we know about temperature, but about rainfall, we know very little. And of course, rainfall in this region supports agriculture. It's basically an agrarian region. But then it also brings floods. It brings riverine floods. It brings bank cutting. It leads to sand casting. And it also leads to a unique problem between Nepal and India. It's called border inundation. You know, just few diagrams. And of course, floods are not simply rural phenomena anymore. You know, this is uh, 2019 flood somewhere in, you know, Bihar. You know, it's, you know, mall. You go and build a mall in uh, rivers. So, flood plain. So what would happen? This is what you get. And then, of course, this guy goes and starts, oh, the flood came and killed me, you know, I need some compensation. But you, you allow this kind of development to go on, right? Now, this is a unique problem that I want to sort of, you know, highlight. These are, you know, about 29 points along Nepal-India border where, you know, sort of embankments have been built across the border in India, and they cause inundation in territories of Nepal. Now, this has been an irritant between these two countries trying to solve, but unfortunately, problems are not getting solved. It's an irritant that could be solved. You know, it's something that's solvable. And perhaps a little bit of a framing of mind would be needed to solve this problem. The last 50 years, government have sat together and done some conversations to try to solve that problem. I looked at the minutes of conversation between government of Nepal and government of India last 50 years. And interestingly, what I find is that I'm an engineer. I'm a trained civil engineer and a hydraulic engineer. In last 50 years, every time the solution is structural. You say, OK, we build embankment. The next meeting, you build embankment. And that's going on for last 50 years. You know, it's a little bit institutional filter there. You don't talk about other perspective. You don't talk about geography. You don't talk about livelihood, you don't talk about vulnerability and forget gender, you know, nothing about gender. So therefore, while the participation as women have increased, you know, we really need to do much more to change the institutional culture. And of course, for India, it's a nominal problem, you know, it's in the border area, but for Nepal, it's a substantial issue. So perhaps a more conversation, a more intense, you know, understanding needs to be done as we move forward. Now, what's happened again, you know, if you build embankment, I want to take you back to 2008. This is Kosi River, you know, this river comes from Tibet, flows into Nepal and then into Bihar. And then Nepal-India Treaty in 1954 has embanked this river all across. And in 2008, about a mile of this embankment breached in Nepal. And 3.5 million people in Bihar and about 50,000 in Nepal were seriously affected. So therefore, yes, you can have technological intervention, but there are risks and the impacts cascade down boundaries. And then, of course, there is rapid pace of urbanization in Nepal Tarai and, of course, in across the border. If you can look at these images, these are six cities along the border. As you can see, you know, this is 2000, this is 2022, 2000, 2022. 
this built up areas has expanded and the waterscape has kind of you know declined and this is what happens you know you go and build houses in the wetlands and then you know excuse and then uh, led to lots lots of loss of water bodies and then what this does is to a little bit of a water science you know if you will sort of bear with me for a little bit uh, some time you see when you have lots of vegetation and you have sort of space a lot of water goes in and then into the river and then you have a base flow that's something like this now you cut vegetation you concretize your face the surface very little got water goes into the ground and then what you get is extreme extreme flood that way all right of course in that area groundwater is also going down in pockets also we have arsenic contamination increasing pollution this is one of the river that flows from nepal into uh, bihar it's called sirsia in raksol so you can just look at the state of this river lots of sand mining and gravel mining going on you know indiscriminate uh, extraction of river bed materials for uh, sand and gravel and of course what we have done is to you know water and air the two essential fluids in which all life depends have become global garbage cans this is also a French oceanographer, Jacques Yves Costeau. So, clearly, you know, another example, you know, small rivers in these regions are dying. This is one example, tweet from a friend of mine, Professor Venkatesh Datta. Four rivers in uh, Lucknow, you know, they have all vanished, they are all dead. So, this is no longer acceptable. We should not accept that. And of course, I take it from President, uh, former President Obama. We can, we must, and we will change the state of affairs. And that requires a common commitment and perhaps, you know, the kind of leadership that we are talking about. Why? Because rivers are arteries of planet Earth, linking oceans, the clouds, and the land. They pulse and they are rhythmic in relation to climate, geography, floodplains, community, and functions. And of course, they meet different functions, health and sanitation, salute, environment, economy hydropower, irrigation, industries, so on and so forth. And also they're part of our ethical values and culture. So the five pillars of resilience I talked about, reduced exposure to biophysical hazards, the natural ecosystem, the infrastructure, the rules and policy, and users and managers. So they all need to come together if you want to build resilience. And of course, as a waterman, I would like to focus on the fact that you know, you need to think about water, not just S2O. We also have to think about water as S2O, energy, biodiversity, and sediment. These are intrinsic part of river, and this is a new framing. So what's the guiding philosophy as we move forward? First, you know, rivers need to have space. They need to have a pathway to flow freely and clean and sustain iconic uh, biodiversity and human needs. Maintain flood evacuation routes, conserve space and pro promote recharge. Waste cycle and water cycle should be separate and new tools is needed to deal with extreme climate events. And then of course, water education has to be interdisciplinary. And finally, on the transboundary river that I talked about that flew from Nepal into India, we need to begin maintaining in, in inventory of these rivers. There has to be at least in a couple of rivers a joint collaborative study between academia in Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and in Nepal to begin to figure out what's going on, what's the status, how do we move forward, what are the risks, and what are the opportunities. And of course, this should lead to more dialogue and conversation. Thank you very much. You know, I came to highlight this very marginalized and sort of you know unexplored uh, status of rivers, and hopefully. It will prod us to think differently as this new leadership uh, of G20 that India is talking about. Let's also look backwards and create a new paradigm, new imagination of rivers, including small rivers. Because if these small rivers die, Ganga River dies. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dixit. Some uh, very important uh, points and, and I think some wisdom into your presentation, which is very important. I've, you know, there's strong interdependency 
of water in South Asia. And there are these what is described as hydropolitical security complexes that emerge between upper riparians and the lower riparians. And I often say that, you know, South Asia has to be looked at through its geography. The more we look at geography, the better we understand the complexities of South Asia. And if you look at India in the middle of South Asia, it is both an upper riparian with Pakistan and Bangladesh, but it is a down riparian with, with Nepal and, and, and China. So there is this uh, complexity which we need to unravel and understand. I think you're quite right. Um, unfortunately, the dysfunctional relationship, the political relationship between India and Nepal often stumps the larger water cooperation uh, that is needed and required. Uh, also something important with Nepal is that we focus more on sharing the benefits, not sharing the volumes of the water, which we do with Pakistan and which we do with Bangladesh. But with Nepal, it's a very special sort of a relationship of, of building up benefits. And that becomes very important when we look at the regional context of South Asia. But yet again, I would emphasize focusing more on the bilateral approaches uh, to gaining some of the, uh, the benefits. So I think water approaches in, in the neighborhood, I think must truly be science-based. We need to still understand the water in the region, really. And we need to measure it much more carefully. And it has to be, I think, systemically designed, the whole framework and how we should deal with water uh, for the benefits and then systematically implement it. And that's where I think political leadership and political wise thought uh, would be important in the region. So thank you, uh, yeah. Dr. Vikshan. May I uh, now <coughs> invite Ms. Wawin? Thank you. Would you like to use both? Huh? Hello. Okay, thank you. Um, I would like to thank um, IDSC for inviting me to this very important uh, conference. And I will also like to thank uh, Chema University and Noli Sagar Foundation for allowing me to present this uh, research. So uh, this morning we uh, talk about the economic, you know, uh, crisis, uh, environmental degradation and water crisis and food security issue and also conflict and uh, this uh, 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 afternoon section I am going to present the consequences of all that um, issue that we discussed the whole morning and this afternoon so um, uh, I my study will focus on the migration and remittances between Myanmar and uh, Thailand and I will start with the some uh, uh, interesting facts about the migration trend of Myanmar. Uh, out migration from Myanmar to neighboring ASEAN countries was uh, estimated uh, to be nearly 5 million uh, or 10 percent of uh, Myanmar population in 2014 and out of which 90 percent of uh, migrants chose to walk in uh, Thailand. Uh, why they chose to work in Thailand, you will see uh, after the, you know, uh, 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 introduction. So, uh, um, uh, our uh, migrant workers, they crossed through the land border to Thailand, and it was estimated uh, 4 million in total. Uh, that was estimated in um, 2018. And um, over 50% of those working in Thailand are informal migrant workers, which means they cross through the border without uh, 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 proper documentation. Uh, uh, Dr. Zonai also present about the current you know, situation in Myanmar. So with the uh, current political and economic situation, the illegal crossing border is increasing. And at this point, uh, nearly 100,000 illegal migrant uh, workers were under uh, detention in uh, uh, Thailand and women migrants face even more high risks of uh, trafficking. Uh, uh, since we have a uh, migrant workers in Thailand, uh, we got remittances. So most migrants uh, tend to remit back their uh, dependent family household in Myanmar, and uh, they use uh, uh, informal channels. And uh, I, I we, we will explore later uh, to this more. 
from the migrant workers uh, in 2018, World Bank estimated that it, the, the official, uh, officially estimated that the remittances is uh, 3.8, you know, billion US dollar. And it also estimated that an official will be 3% higher than this. So, um, three times, three times higher than, you know, uh, uh, that official estimate. So it was larger than the, uh, our export revenue uh, in 2018. So, uh, researchers are still continue uh, to debate uh, whether remittances strengthen the households and communities or undermine them. Uh, and they highlight a need for more detailed understanding of their roles in household economies. So, according to the previous study, and also for the case of Myanmar, most remittances sent to family used for a daily consumption, education, saving, and and also paying for the debt for their migration. Uh, only small percentage of remittances are reinvested for their uh, family businesses and also for the uh, agricultural sector. But mo most of the migrants, uh, they simply repeat uh, their migration due to the less development impact of the uh, remittances. That's why leveraging uh, remittances for economic Recovery and future resilience of Myanmar is uh, very um, uh, is very important for Myanmar. In slides, uh, this slide, I would like to describe the visual circle of conflict uh, leading to the irregular migration and informal uh, remittances. When a migrant becomes uh, irregular, uh, he or she has to use the informal uh, uh, remittances to send money back home. So they use a uh, informal channel, and according to to our research, um, uh, almost all uh, migrant workers they use the uh, informal channel to send money back home. Even they have uh, uh, some workers they have a uh, proper documentation, but they they prefer to use the informal uh, channel. So one household use it mainly for good uh, food and consumption and coping from the conflicts, it does not contribute to the development of the uh, communities. So households remain poor and jobless, and they have to repeat the uh, uh, migration again. So at this time, some unemployed youth uh, become available for the recruitment into the conflicts. So that's the, also another you know, ongoing study between the states and you know, economic situation, uh, and how that, that is linked to the conflicts, and I will also um, present some findings from our earlier research. Um, so uh, informal remittances are also associated with uh, illicit trade and underground economy. So they all are high again, non-traditional security threats to the uh, neighboring economies. So we have two research objectives for this study, and we, will, we uh, try to observe the link, linkage between migration and conflict dynamics in Myanmar by comparing post-conflict and active conflict areas. Uh, and another uh, research objective is to examine whether remittances sent by the diaspora uh, uh, and migrants to their dependent families in home, home regions shape conflict dynamics directly or indirectly in Myanmar. So, in order to achieve this research objectives, uh, we use the uh, we the study used the survey taken in 2020 on the returning migrant uh, who were under the uh, um, uh, 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 under the uh, uh, center uh, built by the Myanmar government for the uh, as the quarantine center. So. That uh, three regions are Karen and Mon State, where a uh, border area of uh, Thailand, and, and uh, Karen has an uh, active conflict, and Mon State is the post-conflict area, and also another region which has a high, uh, a high uh, percentage of the uh, recipient family of remittances, which is Baku. Uh, at the uh, survey was taken in 2020, Baku region is. Uh, uh, non-conflict area, uh, but the situation now is a little different, but at that time, they have a more uh, 
uh, good economic opportunity since they are close to the former capital city, now commercial city, Yangon, and also the capital city, uh, uh, Nebido. And uh, from, from this research, these are the results that uh, we uh, 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 taken from that research. Uh, nearly 85% of migrants are under 40 years of age, and 27% are young adults of age group between 17 and 25, which suggests that there are uh, pools of uh, 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 youth uh, to recruit for the conflicts. And more than 70% of migrants now pass middle schools, reflecting low education of migrating youth. That's also another reason that uh, ninety percent of uh, you know migrants chose to work in Thailand because they uh, they do not need you know education to work in the uh, uh, Thailand. So that's why uh, uh, over eighty percent of them had no or uh, uh, little skills. Um, another interesting thing is nearly fifty percent of house household engaged in agricultural sector, but only two percent of them work in manufacturing sectors. But when they went to the Thailand, uh, uh, most of them also uh, joined in uh, manufacturing sector. Uh, only 35% of household own agricultural cultivable land, but 90% of them have agricultural land less than 10, 10 acres. Household are small holding farmers with very little opportunities to engage in non-farm activities and uh, small businesses. Uh, 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 according to our uh, 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 analysis, uh, household in post-conflict regions use remittances for their for their livelihood growth, small business expansion, and agricultural investment. While active conflict regions use them mainly for consumption and co coping uh, uh, for their efforts. So remittances then tend to consolidate post-conflict recoveries and uh, uh, development. Uh, the, another uh, 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 findings uh, from this analysis it in post conflict regions um, uh, like Mon State, uh, there are much higher employment opportunities or integration options for the returning migrants and shaping their remittances to use and repeat migration efforts. While active conflict regions do not offer similar opportunities to the returning migrants. That's increasing the migrants of repeat migration. That's uh, 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 at first I mentioned uh, at, uh, the Karan state, which is also the uh, 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 bordering uh, region with the Thailand. And the the, the conflict in in this region is you know uh, uh, more active uh, uh, than in the past. The, this is the another uh, findings from that analysis. Uh, households in active conflict areas such as Karen State have the highest intention of repeat migration because they could not uh, uh, invest not only on economic but also for the education. Um, so, at, at, uh, there are some, you know, uh, conclusion uh, from this uh, analysis and also some uh, policy recommendation for the uh, government of India. Uh, uh, from this, you know, findings, uh, these are the uh, primary conclusion that we can draw. Uh, the remittances serve as an essential social safety net mechanism for migrant dependent households in Myanmar. And another one is that remittances do not contribute to sustained social recovery of conflict affected households in Myanmar. And that remittances have still not contributed to a uh, a virtuous circle of migration where migrants and their uh, dependent households do not have to repeat migration to uh, survive be because there is no uh, enabling, uh, you know, environment for the uh, agricultural sector. They are under investment by the uh, public sector and also they are mismatched for experience and skill of manufacturing work gain in Thailand because most of the women who work in Thailand they engage in like household work or, or helper for the restaurants. When they get back home, uh, uh, instead of trying to the workforce, they end up at the work 
uh, at home working for the you know household job uh, uh, and only men can uh, choose their skill uh, when they you know uh, work in Thailand they can land at the construction sector and when they come back home they can use that skill uh, at the uh, 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 businesses and local businesses in Myanmar. So uh, uh, these informal remittance channels are also associated with the illicit trades and underground economies that also fuel the conflicts because all the remittances, when they use the uh, informal channels, uh, that never cross the border. It's and at the border and the, that, uh, you know, illicit trade uh, traders, they use another channel uh, inside the country. So that uh, uh, right now, Myanmar government and also Thai government are also under discussion. But uh, with the current situation, we uh, also don't know what, how we can, you know, sort it out. Uh, these are the, uh, our policy recommendations uh, for the uh, 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 government of India. So uh, leveraging remittances for development and designing incentive scheme for formal remittances and legal migration, uh, government of India can lend its innovative experience of digital and fintech solutions for the institution in the region. Because this morning, you know, we also talk about the, uh, a lot about the digital uh, 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 transformation. So we are also eager to uh, lend and, you know, implement uh, inside the country. Um, uh, and also, uh, uh, you know, international community and can also uh, help us by complementing the remittances with social and humanitarian cash transfer program. And uh, well, we also hope that government of India can advocate uh, development partners for the uh, program integration. And <clears throat> also, we also would like to channel the remittances for households use of investment. Um, Government of India can showcase such schemes of support to vulnerable households. Um, uh, another one, uh, the final one is accessible and affordable circular migration with a special focus on strengthening of formal migration process between South-South economies. Migration patterns of the future will be more of two-way circle migration rather than one-way street from South to Northern countries. Thus, um, uh, government of India and leaders of southern countries should also leverage on global institutions uh, managing such mobility. We also believe that uh, it's also uh, our uh, government duties and resp responsibility, but we also need helping hand hands from our uh, neighboring countries and also, you know, other. Uh, uh, partners who are interested in the region, uh, security and peace, and also for the development. Uh, that the end of the presentations, and thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, uh, Ms. Wavin. Thank you uh, for your uh, careful observation of the linkages between migration and conflict dynamics. I think that case study would be useful to understand the other border areas in the region. Also, thank you very much for the policy recommendations. This will indeed be very useful. And uh, the chair of T20 would certainly look into some of these recommendations, especially on the digital measurement uh, and verifications and reporting. I think that will be uh, quite important to, to monitor the situation. And that can be very useful in the G20 platform, I think. So thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me now quickly invite Dr. Ramani I just use this right. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to this conference. It has been a very stimulating and uh, inspiring experience. Uh, I also like to thank India for adopting this inclusive approach uh, in its leadership, uh, getting the views of neighboring countries. It's much appreciated. 
Uh, today I'm uh, talk. I'm going to talk about ensuring gender equality and decent work. Uh, the challenge of it through Sri Lanka's multiple crises. Uh, my friend from Sri Lanka, Anushka, gave you a very good understanding, I think, of the crisis we are facing. Uh, there are multiple crises which followed COVID. They have impacted businesses, jobs, and income. Uh, at the end of the pandemic, we only recovered about half the jobs lost. Since then, when the multiple crises kicked in, uh, I think there have been more jobs lost, but the data hasn't come in yet. So what we have is an economy which needs to grow through the impending global economic recession, not only to manage the balance of payments and debt crises, but also to mitigate the impact of those crises and the management of those crises on poverty. Ensuring gender equality and full and productive employment and decent work for all by 2030 will be particularly difficult, if not impossible. The crises have impacted women more in a very practical way. You saw the gas cylinders being carried, uh, carried by men. But it is the women at home who have had to juggle without gas, uh, trying firewood, uh, finding uh, different ways of preparing food, uh, and that's only gas. Uh, with the electricity cuts, you, you had to do all that in the dark. Uh, and then you had uh, other crises like the fuel crisis, so transport, uh, jobs, children's schooling, all were affected, and when children's schooling is affected, again, the, the the burden is borne by women. So the crises have impacted women more in terms of jobs too. Uh, women's employment dropped by 22% compared to 8%, that is due 8% for men, that is during uh, the COVID uh, crisis. The crises have also aggravated gender inequalities and worsened underlying factors that have long disadvantaged women in Sri Lanka's labor market. What are these disadvantages? You can see from this graph uh, that women's participation in the labor force has been low around, mid, around the mid-30s for a very long time. Unemployment amongst women, that is those who decide to participate and look for jobs, uh, the ones who are, su are not successful doing that, uh, relatively there are more women in that situation than men. Now, women who do get jobs, they are generally paid less for their productive characteristics than men with the same productive characteristics. Apart from, from that sort of uh, uh, obvious discrimination, you find that when you look at the distribution of wages across the spe spectrum, women are concentrated far more densely in the lower wage ranges, except in the public sector. If you look at that orange curve, for example, which represents the density of informal private employees, there are far more of them, relatively far more of them in the lower wage ranges than uh, comparative males, which is, which is the blue line. Uh, so you find women are clustered at the lower end of the wage scale than men in almost every uh, segment other than the public sector, where, where really more skilled women uh, enter the public service and, and there's, of course, less wage discrimination. Sri Lankan women need to navigate three ring fences of obstacles if they are to work for pay. The first ring fence is, of course, the, the terrible macroeconomic situation, and, and that situation has been going on for much longer than seems obvious. Uh, 
There are internal political economy forces that have given rise to it, shocks and of course external market conditions. Then you have economic and social cultural conditions in the local environment, which impede women from working for pay. And finally, individual and household level characteristics, which impinge on the decision to participate. Take the macroeconomic inhibitors first. Sri Lanka's economy has long operated well inside its production possibility frontier. And I would, when I say long, it is very long. Uh, even after economic liberalization in 1977, we really didn't manage to get an efficient allocation of resources and, and come to where our production possibility frontier was. The recent crises have, I think, pushed us further back in within the production possibility frontier. One hopes not permanently, but if it has an effect on human capital, uh, as it is likely to through the education system, uh, uh, through, through deficiencies and impacts on the education system and on nutrition, then things are going to be very, very difficult and there is likely to be development in reverse. The other macroeconomic inhibitor which we have struggled with for a long time is that production structures remain undiversified and technologically backward. In, in manufacturing, for instance, most producers are operating with IR2 technology and, and don't even know about IR4 technology. Exports have stagnated, as Anushka pointed out. Low tech products dominate. They make up 90% of total exports. Production activities are dominated by low-skilled workers earning low wages, and women especially are heavily concentrated in a few sectors and in low-skilled occupations. Of course, the occupational and sectoral structures of production also show high levels of gender-based segregation, and this is the kind of straight jacket which has dominated women's employment in Sri Lanka. Sector specific characteristics in certain subsectors dominated by low skilled labor uh, uh, have a, have a, appear to in, influence the, need, the demand for women's work. Labor productivity is negatively and significantly associated with the demand for female workers in manufacturing. So basically, you have sectors which are low productivity, low technology, and so you demand low skilled workers. And, and that, that is a kind of structural uh, determinant of the demand for women workers. Employers, if employers see, think that women lack the skills necessary for the business, and that's, that there are social norms which prescribe the kind of jobs women can and cannot do, uh, they tend to hire fewer women. But in a recent study I did for UN Women with uh, Sunil Chandrasiri, we found that uh, employers, uh, if, if employers are male, uh, they, they, are, they are less likely to hire women and the effect of the of of uh, they are basically fifteen percent less likely to employ uh, women. Uh, inability to offer flexible working hours and night work for women in shops and offices because of uh, restrictions in in uh, labor regulations uh, also have a negative impact. Then there are the individual and household characteristics, which are pretty much common to to. Uh, almost all, all societies, maybe more so in, in, in uh, the Middle Eastern and, and South Asian regions. The inhibiting factors are incomes, are remittances from abroad, uh, which have a kind of income effect. Uh, then uh, Islamic women tend not to participate in the labor market, all other things being equal. Health is a big determinant, and in another study I was involved in, uh, we found that in Northern Province, which was a province which was badly affected by, by the conflict, uh, poor health, 
poor self-perceived health was a big inhibitor of labor force participation. Then the usual issues of uh, having very small children and more employed with males in, in the household. Social norms about women's roles and culturally appropriate employment also have an impact. And there are these perceptions about gender roles which show that Sri Lankan society is still very traditional. Uh, wives are less likely to participate if they think that if the wife works, then the children are likely to be neglected and go astray. And, 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 and women have to face uh, very negative remarks from relatives, uh, other, others in society, and even teachers who, who may be female themselves, but take it upon themselves to, to uh, point to uh, mothers, working mothers, uh, uh, and, and say that it is because you are uh, working that your child is not performing in school. Uh, these are, are barriers which, which need to be negotiated. Wives are more likely to participate in, in the labor market if they think that the extra income, uh, if husbands think that the extra income earned is useful and helps reduce the pressure on husbands. What are the policy directions emerging from this? And, and I think some of these will be common to other countries in the region. First, we, we have to get the engine moving. We have to uh, get the macroeconomic policy mix right. And we need to push export-led economic growth, diversify and upgrade productive structures, and promote productive efficiency. We need to increase women's acquisition of skills, particularly of English language skills and the capacity to learn and solve problems. Uh, our education system, though free, is very much bound by, you know, read, memorizing that, you know, the emphasis on transferring knowledge rather than how to do things, uh, very old fashioned. Uh, we need strategies that promote small and medium firms, female entrepreneurship, ownership and management, and also the retention of women workers in uh, workplaces after marriage. We also need labor law reforms uh, that facilitate flexible working hours and night work for women, which socialize the costs of maternity benefits and ensure decent work standards in new forms of employment. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. I think uh, especially on the bit on perceptions about uh, gender roles, I think there is larger uniformity here in, in South Asian states. And the policy directions, again, I think that will be very useful uh, for the T20 Go group. Uh, to look at those recommendations because women are very central to the whole idea of uh, of uh, India's leadership uh, in the G20. The final presentation uh, for the day is by Ashat Shinha. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very good afternoon to you all. Uh, before I start off my presentation for the day, I was very impressed by the speech given by Dr. Sandhya, chair of uh, W20. Uh, she highlighted that uh, she was working towards women-led development. And among the five um, aspects or the areas that they will be highlighting, it included education and skill development, which since I come from the education background, I was very impressed. And the other thing I would like to note is that um, T20 Secretariat, uh, Ms. Sunaina also highlighted that they will be having a conference very soon in March uh, 5th, where they will be inviting non-G20 countries as well. So I guess it would be an opportunity for more leaves as well. So to start off my presentation for today, I will be focusing on challenges faced by women leaders in higher education institutions in the Maldives.
and these are the contents that I'll be covering. Okay, since uh, we belong to a Muslim community, the social position of women, uh, Muslim women has evolved dramatically in the past last 20 years. And as a result, there has been increasing prevalence of women at all levels of education, in various fields of employment and in aspects of public life, women now seeking to achieve the highest leadership roles in all sectors, including higher education, and also to participate in various positions and decision-making process in both public and private sections. Women aiming to leadership positions, however, they encounter a lot of challenges due to uh, uh, which I will be highlighting in my slides. Okay, as I have said, my objective is to find out the challenges faced by women in higher education institutions in the Maldives. And it's not just Maldives that they are concerned. I think I went through some of the research done by other countries as well. Uh, around the globe, this is, I guess, the same because similarities occur. Here, Uganda, Andhra Pradesh, uh, UK, uh, Tanzania, Saudi Arabia, and also Maldives, Tanzania, Australia, Philippines, UK. So all these, the headlines, they are talking about challenges faced by uh, women leaders. And this is, all these researchers, research are confined to higher education. Talking about the context, uh, I'm from Maldives, the Republic of Maldives, and it's a republic. And we speak a unique language, which is called Divahi. And we, we are a 100% Muslim community. And our capital is Male, where most of the people reside. And we have uh, Rufia, and the main occupation is uh, tourism. And as you can see, the Maldives is a chain of 26 coral islands. And uh, there are 1,200 small islands in the Maldives where only 200 are inhabited. And if you look at the women representation at government level, 30% cabinet members are women, 4.6 women represents the parliament, and 39.5% women in the local governments. And this, this uh, decentralization act was very recently, uh, it came out and it mandated that a minimum of 33% women should be in the local level, it should represent the local level. And if when we reflect on the civil service uh, statistics, we can see that 49% uh, of Maldives population belongs uh, we are women out of which are uh, 62 percent of the women represent the civil they are civil servants and in may 2022 civil service commission they launched a survey to identify why there is a lack of women in leadership positions and i couldn't find the published uh, results of this so i'm not able to share it However, uh, there was one um, survey done with in collaboration with uh, the parliament, the Maldives National University. They conducted the survey and I found that just now, I think uh, um, Miss, I forgot her name. Yeah, Guna, Guna Tilak, right? I think the challenges that you have highlighted, especially on wages and things, they were very common from this survey that uh, was undertaken by the uh, National University. Okay, classification of higher education, we have nine private colleges and one government, and we have only two universities, that is Maldives National University and ours, which is Islamic University, and we were established in, in the year 2015. So we are also in a very infant stage, I would say. And with regard to the classification of uh, in terms of gender, females are found to be dominant in the academia. I'm talking about females dominant, but not in the higher level. Uh, say uh, the academic staff, females dominate. 
But if you look at uh, even in our university, the top management, vice chancellor, chancellor, deputy chancellors, they are all male, except just one deputy vice chancellor, that is research and innovation. And with regard to the senior management, 23 of them are there, but three female women, no, females are in the team. I'm talking about my university. And the challenges, these challenges falls into three categories. One is uh, organizational challenges, the other one social and religious challenges, and the other one belongs to the personal challenges. I'll go one by one. When it comes to religious and social challenges, uh, it's a belief, as I have said, we belong to a Muslim country, and I'm sure, uh, as everybody knows, men are the breadwinners, and women should be responsible for the upbringing of the children. We have to do all the whole, whole, all the all chores, and men are the leaders. And even in Islam, it encourages that uh, men should be the leader. And I'm not from the Islamic, I mean, a scholar, so I won't be able to give a brief, I mean, justification why men should be the leaders. But I'm sure there are exceptions. And I guess uh, just now, once again, I would like to highlight the previous uh, talk by Miss Gunatilaka, the same thing happened. I think this stereotyping is still there. It's not only in Maldives. And among the organizational challenges, uh, heavy workload, lack of career development opportunities. Uh, I'm talking about when it comes to uh, career development opportunities, it's always the men who will be picked. It's I don't know why, but still it's the men who will be picked and they will be given this opportunity. Discrimination at the workplace, lack of role models and mentors, male dominant, dominated networks, intimidation and harassment, and voice not being heard. I would In this instance, I would like to share one of my experiences. Uh, I was in a panel where they recruited a lecturer for, the, uh, for our university. And when they shortlisted, there were 10. And among those 10, I found one, I mean, we all agreed that that particular person is the right fit for the university. But you know why? She was rejected. She was three months pregnant. You know what the panelists said? Uh, there were two ladies, the rest were male dominant in the panel as well. So they said, if we recruit this lady, the next six months, who will take over? She will be going for labor. So this is the mentality which we are talking about. Personal challenges, qualification. Once again, uh, if we reflect to Moldivian, uh, there are, f I think now the trend is changing, but when it comes to qualification, Previously, it was the men, but now, alhamdulillah, now the women, they have started. When we look into the, now, I mean, uh, say 20, 2021 statistic, we would see that in the higher education, the number of students enrolling in the courses, the female population is getting higher, which is a good sign, I guess. Lack of self-confidence, um, difficulties faced in balancing personal and professional life, of course, uh, and lack of support from the family. This is one of the major things that these, uh, the women leaders, they have highlighted since they have, I, as I have said, they have a life and everybody, even the mother-in-laws, mothers, husbands, they think that it's our job. We have to take care of them, right? And uh, when it comes to, as I have said previously, in the organization level as well, they give chances for the men. I guess this also hinders because they, you, uh, I also have been hearing those things. They have to go as soon as the clock strikes two o'clock. They have to rush home. They have to take care of their kids. But men, they can stay longer. They can stay until six, eight. But I don't think it's the time which matters. It's what you do, the quality of work that you do, it's not the time. I don't, as far as I'm concerned, it's not a fact, right? 
rushing home at two is not the fact that we should be deprived for, of those. And dealing with uh, different personalities is once again something that uh, women leaders, they have highlighted. It seems that maybe being a woman, we are very humble. And when it comes to dealing with uh, maybe conflicts or when conflicts arise, they will be more loud. They have a loud voice, so we should be quiet, right? Maybe those are some of the things that they are facing. And these have been... Uh, uh, Seth, could you kindly conclude with yeah. policy recommendations if you have? Okay. Yeah, that's nice. As I... Uh, highlighted there are several barriers which women might be experiencing in the academia and i think with this um uh i would say that uh i would end up this uh presentation wishing this uh entire g20 uh team success and i guess maldives will be part of this uh g20 and we will benefit from your uh, activities so thank you very much and that's it for me Thank you. I'm horribly sorry for having uh, it's okay. cut you out, but we're just running completely out of time. Uh, um, since we don't have time, I will uh, conclude uh, this session and uh, invite you all uh, for tea. Just to say that I think in this in this session, we got something very new, uh, especially SDG 5 uh, and uh, SDG 8, your presentation. Uh, the larger uh, urgent actions on climate change is SDG 13, which I think the entire uh, South Asian country would need to uh, put their hat on and think about. Um, the one thing missing, I think, in the entire G20 debate today um, has been on the demography and, uh, and population. And I think this goes for the entire South Asian country. And uh, interestingly, uh, in India's G20 leadership, it will coincide with India becoming the largest population country in the world having overtaken China. But uh, I think that has to be seen as an opportunity to think about uh, leveraging its demographic dividends. And I think this goes across countries in South Asia. America. Not really yours, yeah, but yeah, aging. aging huh? So I think this is something that needs to be factored in. Uh, um, and I think um, the whole idea about uh, intersectionality uh, between population, health, gender, and development issues uh, has to be also wisely explored. Uh, there is also, I think, need to prioritize uh, family planning um, and, and beyond just being a health agenda uh, and bring it more as a, as a socio-economic uh, one uh, in that framework. So I think, thank you very much. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, chairing this session. And uh, for sure, this session in particular has not been discriminatory to women. Like that. So thank you very much. All the very best, and I invite you all for tea outside. Thank you. The session was truly thought-provoking. On behalf of the Director General MPIDSA, I extend our gratitude to the Chair and all the speakers for the erudite presentations. We would now take a break. However, we are running behind schedule, and I would request you all to please take a quick cup of tea and reassemble here for the final leg of today, the keynote address. The next session will begin in 10 minutes. Thank you.
Good evening and welcome. We are privileged to have with us Ambassador Harshvardhan Shringla, the Chief Coordinator for India's G20 Presidency. He will be delivering the keynote address of the conference. Although Ambassador Shringla needs no introduction, I would be remiss in my duty to not do so. Ambassador Shringla has served as the Foreign Secretary of India and prior to that, he was India's Ambassador to the United States. He has served in various positions across six countries and has served in the Ministry of External Affairs as Joint Secretary for Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar and Maldives. He has also headed the United Nations Political and SAF Divisions in the Ministry. Earlier, he served as Director of the Northern Division dealing with Nepal and Bhutan and as Deputy Secretary of the Europe West Division. May I request Director General MPIDSA, Ambassador Sujan R. Chenoy to kindly conduct the proceedings. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Sindhu. And uh, uh, let me begin by firstly extending a very warm welcome on behalf of all of us to Ambassador Harsh Shringla, the Chief Coordinator for uh, G20 in India. It is uh, the dynamic G20 Secretariat that is powering our uh, presidency. And as you have all seen and acknowledged, we have got off to a very good start. Uh, as the Think20 Chair for India, it's a great privilege for me to welcome my friend and colleague, uh, and also to add to what has just been said about him. Uh, we could not have found a better speaker for our uh, special address this afternoon uh, than Ambassador Harsh Shringla, for he knows uh, uh, this subject uh, extremely well. His personal experience uh, over decades, uh, his personal handling of relations uh, in the Ministry of External Affairs at, at multiple levels, dealing with uh, the South Asian region, uh, and eventually as Foreign Secretary, uh, he obviously has what you might call a bird's eye view of all that's uh, happening in our part of the world. Uh, incidentally, this um, morning we had uh, a very good address by the Sherpa, uh, Mr. Amitabh Kant, uh, and later we also had uh, a very good uh, and very frank and candid uh, uh, special address by Mr. Sonobe. Uh, and so all this uh, means we have really uh, got off to a very good start. The afternoon session in particular, I thought brought out in a very granular manner, uh, some of the issues in South Asia in particular. Uh, and I was very pleased to see that uh, there was fulsome participation, there was gender equality, uh, and that uh, there was a country perspective. There was, in fact, a bottom-up approach uh, to uh, the discourse. Uh, and the participating scholars uh, brought out uh, very sp specific uh, and uh, concrete, uh, you know, uh, situations uh, and suggestions uh, for amelioration, for achievement of the sustainable development goals. And so we covered virtually every aspect of uh, uh, progress and development in South Asia, including uh, water resources, uh, employment opportunities uh, in the workplace, uh, gender equality, and so on and so forth, migration, remittances, all sorts of issues were covered. Uh, so I think uh, we uh, uh, today are really privileged to have you here and might I suggest uh, uh, that you perhaps consider sharing your vision not only of the G20 uh, with which they are uh, quite familiar by now but also your personal insights into how we might uh, you know integrate uh, this great effort that we are making between India and other South Asian countries uh, to achieve something concrete uh, by way of suggestions. Uh, and in this task, of course, we, as I said earlier, we are greatly helped by the fact that uh, the G7 presidency is with Japan and that Mr. Sonobe uh, is eminently situated there uh, as the T7 president to not only be our good interlocutor in good faith, but also within the G7 that he will have enough traction to convey uh, the broadest possible sentiments that emerge from such a discourse uh, at uh, our end within South Asia, within the rest of us in the G20. So we couldn't have asked for a better uh, situation vis-a-vis uh, -vis the T7 in particular. Um, I would now like to request uh, Ambassador Harsh Shringla to share his vision of uh, particularly South Asian integration, 
for that was uh, one of the lamentable uh, aspects brought out, uh, the inadequacy of integration in South Asia, which has uh, uh, basically acted as a drag on the region's uh, progress, uh, on growth and other developmental opportunities, uh, especially in comparison to what we have seen uh, in Southeast Asia, in East Asia, uh, perhaps even in the Americas. Uh, and uh, what is it that we can do uh, to create new bridges? What is it uh, that we can do, as also emerged in the afternoon session, to think differently and to not adopt uh, the same old approaches that we've had to regional cooperation? So with these few words, may I request you to deliver your keynote address and to enlighten us and to also point to the way forward. The floor is yours. Ambassador Sujan Chinoy, uh, my colleague and friend, uh, who is the chair of the T20 India's uh, T20 uh, process, uh, also director general of the Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, uh, members of the diplomatic corps, um, participants uh, who have come from uh, our neighborhood, but also uh, from other countries, uh, including, of course, the Head of the T7, uh, you know, Mr. Tetsushi Sonobe, uh, who is also uh, the Director General of the Asian uh, Development Bank Institute. Uh, and of course, uh, it's good to see all of our friends uh, from South Asia and our neighboring countries here this evening. Um, I'm also particularly happy to see so many scholars of South Asian studies among us. Uh, and we, uh, I think that's uh, always uh, nice to meet up and connect with all of our friends with whom we have worked uh, so extensively over the past many years on the very issue of uh, our relationships uh, with our neighboring countries and uh, issues that uh, Ambassador Chunai referred to in terms of integration in other areas. Now, um, you've had several sessions uh, on the G20. Uh, I want to just give a very brief perspective because I might be actually repeating what we've already heard. Um, but I'll just touch upon some points that I thought was important to highlight. Uh, what does G20 mean uh, for India? Um, first, of course, is that uh, we've never been president of the G20 before. For, so for us, this is the first uh, opportunity uh, to uh, preside over this influential grouping. Uh, second, of course, that uh, this is perhaps the most significant international event that India has ever hosted. Uh, we've had... Uh, We've been chair of the NAM of, uh, of the Commonwealth Heads of Government uh, in 1983. Uh, we've also hosted the India-Africa Forum Summit in 2015. But those have been one-off events. That means we've hosted a summit and that's it. The G20, as we discovered, is a far more elaborate process uh, that it hosts over 200 meetings uh, you know, until we reach our summit in September. It also means hosting hundreds of side events. Uh, we just, uh, Master Chinoy, Myself, many of us who are here just attended a very significant T20 side event uh, at Bhopal. And you have a number of side events of that nature that contribute and provide very valuable inputs to our presidency. So uh, it is, in other words, a very major exercise. How are we intending to deal with it? One, of course, is that uh, we intend to broad base it. In other words, we intend to have hold meetings of the G20 outside of Delhi in different parts of our country. Uh, the Prime Minister's uh, vision has been that uh, we should make the G20 uh, comprehensible to our citizens. Uh, in order to do so, we need to take the G20 out into as many different parts of our country as possible. Uh, and so we will be hosting G20 meetings in as many as 56 locations across the country. I don't think any other G20 presidency has broad-based meetings to that extent that we have. Uh, it also, I think, has to do with the fact that many of these international events are held in Delhi. So for most of our citizens, it's some remote event in, in the capital city. Uh, what we want to do is to take it right to your doorstep, to take it to places from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Kutch to Kohima. In other words, uh, cover all parts of our country in uh, presenting the G20. The other part of what we're doing is really to make the G20 comprehensible. 
uh, to our citizens. So again, uh, the Prime Minister's view is that this is not just an event to the central government. It is very important that we involve, integrally involve the states and the union territories. We also inform, involve every citizen of India. We make them stakeholders in the process. So we use uh, events such as the, uh, you know, outreach to universities, schools, festivals, quiz competitions, marathons, any uh, mass event that can be used uh, to convey a message uh, about the G20, about India's presidency and what it means. And of course, from our point of view, uh, the G20 is a very representative grouping. Uh, it includes uh, all members uh, of uh, the G7. It includes all members of BRICS, all permanent members of the Security Council. Uh, it, it, it uh, you know, uh, has all the geographies and different uh, ideological groupings represented. So when the G20 takes decisions, uh, these decisions tend to have a resonance across the board. In other words, they are implemented uh, almost by consensus. Uh, the UN, IMF, World Bank, OECD are all members, uh, are all participants in the G20 process. And so they are already integrally involved with the G20. Uh, this year, under our presidency, we've invited a number of uh, countries. Uh, from our neighborhood, we've invited Bangladesh, uh, we've invited Mauritius, uh, we've invited from the Gulf, uh, UAE and Oman, from Africa, Nigeria, uh, Egypt, and of course, Mauritius, also part of Africa, although it's part of our extended neighborhood. Um, and of course, we've invited the ADB, which is a, an international organization, a regional organization. We've invited uh, the International Solar Agency, and we've invited uh, the Coalition for Disaster Resident Infrastructure. So, uh, you know, on the climate change side of things also, we've got uh, very good representation. What does it mean? I mean, since many of you are from, Asia, you know, our neighborhood, um, we obviously have a limitation of the number of countries we can invite for any presidency. Normally, uh, you can invite three or four countries. Uh, there are a number of countries that are already part of the process. So just to explain, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, you have the 19 G20 countries and you have the European Union that are members. You've got Spain, which is a permanent invitee. You've got Netherlands and Singapore that are almost always invited. You've got uh, the UN, IMF, World Bank, OECD, Financial Stability Board. You've got ASEAN and the African Union that are always invited. You've got NEPAD, which is headed by Rwanda, so African representation. Uh, so you already have a very large number of uh, countries and international organizations that are part of a G20 meeting. In addition to that, you invite three, four members. We've invited six countries and three um, organizations. Uh, but it doesn't mean that, I mean, let me make it clear that uh, in terms of our own friends and our neighbors, I think uh, our effort is to make it as inclusive as possible, make sure that as many meetings that are of interest to our friends in the neighborhood um, are those that are accessible to you. Uh, this meeting itself is one example. We were just discussing Ambassador Chinoy and, and myself before I we, before we started the session uh, that uh, that uh, this special initiative that he has taken to host this is is part of that same outreach. That uh, you know we have a T20 process in which there are a certain number of members, but we also have to have other processes that are complementary to this that feed into that process that involve. Uh, other uh, partners and other stakeholders who have have to have a voice in this effort, which is this is the reason that we hosted just recently, uh, you know, the uh, Voice of the Global South uh, Summit, uh, which in which our Prime Minister uh, provided the inaugural address, but it was attended by many heads of state and government and over 150 developing countries. And the reason we took this initiative is because we felt that it was important to understand and listen uh, to the views of uh, the developing world, uh, to try and get a sense of the uh, you know concerns, ideas, proposals that can come forth from uh, the global south that can contribute towards our presidency, and we intend to uh, factor those in and articulate those uh, issues that have arisen during this uh, summit uh, in our G20 uh, presidency process. So uh, we will take into account extensively uh, many of the. Uh, much of the feedback that has come from this process. So uh, we, again, I'm trying to emphasize the fact that uh, 
it is, uh, you know, it is a sort of a consultative process that we intend our presidency to be. It is also an inclusive process. The Prime Minister has already mentioned that our presidency will be bold, inclusive, result-oriented. So from that perspective, I think uh, inclusiv inclusivity is uh, an important factor. Um, now, um, when we talk about, uh, uh, you know, the G20 process, I think it's important also to take into account to link the broad priorities also with uh, that we have identified with uh, with the priorities of uh, you know what are the global priorities today and so uh, you would have heard the broad priorities on a number of occasions uh, from this morning i won't go through them but i just want to stress the point that those broad priorities have been identified taking into account today's situation and today's need what are what how can we respond to what uh, you are saying what the G20 countries are saying. And obviously, as president, we have to take into account that, you know, the views of the developed world, the developing world, views of our neighbors, views of everybody concerned. So that's how we've arrived at certain broad priorities. Everybody wants to see growth, accelerated, resilient, inclusive growth. The SDG process is stalled right in the middle. We want to see how we can give it momentum. Uh, we want to see how we can use uh, uh, platforms like the digital digital platform, how we can use uh, IT um, sector to uh, bridge the digital divide, to work uh, with the developing world to provide services that are very important for all of us. Uh, we want to see how we can reform the multilateral process. In other words, how can we work with the multilateral financial institutions uh, to give them a stronger mandate to be able to deliver on what we need? After all, um, there are as many as 90 developing countries that are today either indebted or close to indebtedness. In our own neighborhood, uh, we have our uh, you know difficulties. COVID-19 has been devastating. Ukraine crisis uh, conflict on top of that has exacerbated the situation. Costs of the fuel and food that we import have gone up. The um, demand for our goods have gone down. Our remittances have slowed. So it impacts on our economies. I mean, uh, all over. It's it's not it's not. There are no exceptions to this. We are all facing the pinch of, uh, I would say, uh, a situation where the globe the growth in uh, on a global basis is contracting. Uh, that demand is is slowing down, and uh, countries like ours have to make that extra effort uh, to ensure that we stay afloat. So, what can the institutions that have been set up to address these issues do? The Bretton Woods institutions. The United Nations. After all, these institutions were created to address exactly such crises. So I think if COVID has proven anything, it, it shows the limitations of the system. And also the fact that uh, today the IMF and the World Bank needs a stronger mandate to be able to garner more resources, uh, including from the private sector, blended financing, private public partnerships. How can they respond to the increase in enhanced uh, demands on their um, on their uh, lending abilities. So uh, we will work with the institutions, with our partners to try and address some of those issues. I, I'm mentioning, I, I build a bit at length on this because it's relevant to you um, uh, as uh, uh, representatives of countries uh, from the developing world, from our neighborhood. Uh, I think all of us face uh, similar issues. So how do we, you know, uh, work uh, within the G20 to make this uh, a more responsive system? And of course, uh, from our point of view, the environment is important. What we are saying is that uh, climate action is, is critical. And uh, in India, we have committed, uh, the Prime Minister talked about the Panch Amrit at the Glasgow COP26 uh, uh, summit uh, <clears throat> the year before last. Uh, we've made some very, very strong commitments. All of us have made commitments, but we need also the means to see that our commitments are realized and our ambitions are fulfilled. Uh, climate financing, climate technology, uh, what are the means to secure those? <clears throat> we are also saying that it is not enough to only focus on climate actions. Uh, the UN Secretary General was here a few months ago, and he said that the world is living at 1.6 times its ability to sustain. Uh, this, in other words, we are live, we are consuming far more than the world can sustain. So, sustainable consumption, sustainable production—it's part of the SDGs, SDG 12. 
uh, we all need to lead lifestyles uh, that are sustainable. We are clearly using too much energy. Uh, we have economies that are based on and waste and uh, we are, we are talking about, I mean, in India, uh, I think in all of our countries, we have been used to, traditionally used to living far more in harmony with, with uh, a natural process, uh, consuming less. Um, we believe in a circular economy. You know, you don't waste products, you utilize them. How can we uh, get some of these ideas out into the world? How can we ensure that along with climate actions, uh, there is also the issue of, uh, um, you know, lifestyle changes? Uh, so. Lifestyle for environment is something that we want to work with our friends uh, in the G20, see how that can, uh, you know, resonate and how that can be utilized uh, extensively across the globe. So um, there are, of course, uh, you know, when, I, when it comes to our broad priorities, I'm just trying to put it in context and how we uh, see some of those uh, priorities. Now, uh, when we come down to South Asia, Asia itself, I think it's... Uh, and of course, our immediate neighborhood. Um, I think, uh, you know, Master uh, Chinoy made a very, very important point, and that is that, uh, you know, integration of our neighborhood is something that is an important issue, has always been an important issue. And South Asia is believed to be one of the least integrated regions in the world. Intra South Asian trade is, is believed to be at a level that is uh, far lower than other regions. We uh, have many other paradigms that we can look at. But I think all that today is changing. My basic premise is that, you know, what you're seeing today is a very, very different scenario than what it was uh, eight, ten years ago. Uh, today, I think uh, this is a South Asia on the move. The rate of growth of our countries, uh, despite all the difficulties, is, is, is far higher than the rest of the world. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, the efforts that we made at integrating our region is far greater than what uh, we have uh, seen uh, even a decade ago. Now, uh, when we talk about integrations, I mean, it is not just uh, connectivity, you know, road connectivity, air connectivity, uh, connectivity, um, you know, by uh, waterways. It's also um, energy connectivity. It's people to people contact. It's internet connectivity. It's, it's a lot of other issues that come in and connectivity integration today uh, is a much more uh, comprehensive sort of, uh, we have to have a more holistic approach uh, to the issue. So um, look at it this way. In 2014, India spent $3 billion on lines of credit, uh, which are soft loans in our neighborhood, focused primarily on infrastructure development, building infrastructure uh, for that connectivity and that integration that we talk about. 2022, it was over $15 billion. And this doesn't include grants in aid, many other schemes that are there that can uh, contribute to um, a greater integration. So um, when you talk about the fact that uh, in the last uh, seven, eight years that we have tripled our lines of credit, it means that we have tripled the number of projects. We are, we are now running about 162 projects in our neighborhood, which are focused exactly on building uh, that vital connectivity, rail, road, air, shipping, whatever you talk about, ports, uh, infrastructure. And uh, it's an integral part of much of MEA's uh, key foreign policy uh, frameworks. The Act East policy, the Neighborhood First policy, even our Indo-Pacific policy are all geared up in, in, in terms of what we start with our neighborhood and then we end up with everything else. So when we look at uh, integrations, then imagine, I think, just uh, take a sort of a, a leap of imagination and think of a fact that you have uh, trains that can move uh, from Delhi through Bangladesh into the rest of the Asian railway network. You have roads uh, that similarly link up uh, through our neighboring countries into the Asian highway. Uh, you have uh, pipelines that connect uh, gas and uh, you have transmission lines that integrate us into one grid. Uh, so if you imagine this, I think it is not very far-fetched because today I think we are in the process of really achieving that level of integration, which we can we could have only dreamt of at one point, uh, 10 years ago when I was uh, Joint Secretary dealing with our neighborhood, uh, we worked very hard on exactly these integrations. Today, 
much of this is 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 coming to as uh, coming to be seen as reality so uh, what are the blueprints i mean take for example the railway line uh, for which the dpr is being prepared from raksol to kathmandu i mean you can have a train that will go from delhi and be in kathmandu uh, in a short time you have uh, the last elements of a train that will take us uh, from delhi uh, to dhaka and from dhaka to agartala in tripura you have uh, the elements of uh, pipelines that can uh, provide uh, high speed diesel uh, from uh, northeast india into uh, bangladesh or from uh, uttar pradesh uh, motihari to amlek ganj in nepal um so we i think today are already you know have the basis for a lot of these integrations transmission lines you have a transmission line that will go from uh you know from bangalgaon and assam through um uh bangladesh into katihar and bihar so through parvatipur into bihar a 760 kv line what does that do i mean i think many of our neighbors uh, bangladesh in particular has been saying that you know we must also be part of your hydroelectric power potential so we have a lot of hydroelectric projects in the northeast in sikkim how can we share that hydro hydroelectric capacity it's not for want of desire it's basically want of infrastructure if we can evacuate surplus power through bangladesh it means bangladesh can take the power that it needs so there is a certain uh, i would say integration already there but there is also a fact that you actually share your resources as you need it we have a very serious plan and this has been there for the last 10 years but today Uh, this plan can become a reality with costs have come down of having an undersea cable between india and sri lanka that can provide uh, an exchange of electricity now sri lanka is an island and some of our friends from sri lanka i'm sure are here and so if you have surplus power there's no way to send it if you are short of power as you found out uh, recently uh, you you know you can't get power from elsewhere so an undersea cable that connects us and today is commercially viable 10 years ago it was not actually enables to exchange electricity be part of the same grid it works very well because we don't have the same peaking hours when you peak you have a peaking hours in sri lanka then we need uh, then we have uh, you know a low lower requirement so we can export power when we peak you can export power to us so this really works very well from that point of view similarly um, what was being talked about in nepal for a long time is becoming a reality um we export 760 megawatts of power to nepal but we are now importing over 1100 megawatts from nepal so under the uh, power trade policy uh, that government of india has introduced recently you can actually import and export power through commercially uh, government uh, you know is happy that it, it facilitates it in fact you can actually export power even to other countries third countries for example nepal can export to bangladesh Uh, and vice versa or bhutan can export to bangladesh so we are happy to have our territory as a sort of a connecting point for power so power exchange becomes more fungible you are able to use power uh, where you need it and when you need it and that i think is also a game changer but why is uh, why are we getting 1100 megawatts in nepal because a lot of private sector power projects are now coming to fruition Uh, some of them are government of nepal projects some of them have been done with indian assistance i mean indian assistance meaning indian investments some are joint ventures some are private uh, purely private uh, power uh, players but uh, the basic fact is that all of this power today is can be exported uh, and the only viable market is uh, population centers and industries in india so nepal has a ready made market and why are we exporting to nepal nepal has a surplus in the west requires power in the east kathmandu and all the major cities are located on a side where you need power so uh, we have the ability instead of uh, constructing very expensive power uh, transmission lines east west we can exchange powers power north north south and we have the ability to buy from nepal sell to nepal what is the sum of all of this building broader infrastructure integrated check posts that Uh, you know tambil dauki on the meghalaya bangladesh border on the more tamo border with uh, myanmar uh, on the uh, raksol birgan border with nepal uh, we have built border 
uh, check posts uh, in a way that can uh, allow for seamless movement of goods uh, and people, of course. So uh, the advantage of all of this, we also worked on NTBs, non-tariff barriers. We worked on sounder trade policies. Uh, all of this has meant that uh, trade between our countries have undergone a very, very significant change. I don't know how many of us are aware that Bangladesh is today our fifth largest trading partner in the world, and Nepal has emerged as our 10th largest trading partner. So I think that is, in many senses, again, a game changer. What we should have done uh, decades ago is being realized today in a South Asian integration that is uh, really, I think, uh, going to change the lives of our people uh, in a way that we haven't really um, envisaged before. And of course, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, uh, all of this, we must talk about new technologies also. I think we must uh, make sure that there is uh, far greater uh, internet uh, connectivity between our countries, Bangladesh, uh, Bhutan, uh, Nepal, India. Uh, there must be much greater emphasis on newer technologies, uh, 5G, artificial intelligence. How can we cooperate? How can we make this uh, a seamless area of seamless connectivity, seamless movement of goods, services, people. Movement of people is very important because, again, a lot of Indians visit Nepal on tourism, Sri Lanka, Maldives. A lot of people from Bangladesh visit India, from Nepal visit India. And what I'm talking about is that there is a flow of people which we must encourage. Um, I know for a fact that uh, uh, because we restructured our visa policies, made it uh, facilitated it. Uh, we increased the number of uh, visas we issued per annum in Bangladesh from 5 lakhs to 18 lakhs in the matter of a year and a half. And uh, it, of course, had a very positive resonance on tourism. Uh, I think this morning uh, we had a session in which uh, the representative of Sikkim said that uh, tourist inflows to the state of Sikkim had increased by 90% in the year uh, 2019, I think. And the reason for that is a, a more liberal visa policy. Um, we um, obviously, um, you know, want to see more of that. Uh, Maldives, for example, we have the Greater Mali Connectivity Project. Again, a very unique uh, infrastructure development project, I think, has never been attempted on those scales. Uh, but what we are doing really is trying to make sure that the integrations of our region, the connectivity part, is, is developed to an extent that uh, uh, I think uh, our countries can uh, realize the fullest potentials of growth, of development, and to meet the aspirations of our people. One factor which is uh, uncontestable is that uh, demographically we are on the same page. I think uh, we are all young countries, a lot of young people. And um, I think it's uh, we all have the same concerns that uh, and same opportunities. How can we provide uh, for uh, uh, you know a better future? How can we cater to the aspirations of this young generation, this aspirational generation uh, through skilling, training, opportunities? And I think uh, you know uh, as we integrate, as we build on infrastructure, as we trade more within ourselves, as we ourselves become more efficient economies that can be used to uh, you know, access other economies. I think that itself is a, is a great way out. And of course, as I said, new technologies uh, are very important uh, for all of our countries. Um, so uh, from that perspective, I think uh, this is uh, something that uh, should give us a huge dividends. And, I, and people to people, I think at the end of the day, what is really important is the people to people connect. I think that is something that uh, uh, is uh, the most critical factor in all of our relationship, uh, how to make sure that the uh, flow of people, that the flow of ideas, that uh, the um, basic uh, premise that we understand each other's countries uh, well is something that is encouraged. Education is one way. Uh, medical tourism, of course, is, is important because uh, a lot of uh, people from our neighborhood come to India for medical treatment. Uh, it's important that we facilitate it, we make it uh, easier, we make it uh, better, and uh, there are many ways of doing that. But, uh, it's it's uh, just to give an example, a lot of people uh, from uh, cross the border and come for treatment into Kohima or to Imphal. Now, um, 
not not much is known about this because it's an informal arrangement you know the uh, they're allowed to cross over get treatment and go back uh, but it's it's far more practical to come this side and get treatment than to go all the way to yangon or some of the larger uh, cities uh, similarly i think um, many of our neighbors have similar i would say uh, areas of uh, uh, you know reasons to come into india and get treatment so uh, when prime minister modi speaks about uh, sabka saath sabka vikas sabka vishwas i think uh, we uh, do really believe that this applies not only to our own country but our entire neighborhood with the premise that unless we all develop we all grow we all have uh, the opportunities to integrate and to expand our infrastructure in a manner that is mutually beneficial to all our countries um it will not help any of us i mean clearly we are so interdependent and interlinked that if india were to say that took um we will go ahead and we don't have to worry about anybody else you do your own thing other countries say the same thing i think it would be counterproductive and i think for too long for the first 50 years we have really uh, been on that mindset today it's a very different mindset i think uh, uh, prime minister modi and the government looks at this uh, the entire region as our strongest priority which is what I, which is why i said that when it comes to our neighborhood then uh, i think the foreign policy framework uh, looks at how we can respond first to our neighborhood and covid was a very good example vaccines vaccine maitri i mean we uh i think in the first 6 months made sure that uh, all of our neighbors had the vaccine that we needed um we ourselves needed to administer over 2 billion vaccines to our citizens but in uh, despite all that i think with most of our neighbors we managed to make sure that you got the vaccine that were required uh we also provide provided therapeutics uh, medicines uh, um and of course uh, there was a time in which uh, liquid medical oxygen uh we remembered the liquid uh the oxygen express trains as they were called you know these containers full of liquid medical oxygen which were going to bangladesh and incidentally because of those containers uh, we are today the container traffic between india and bangladesh has worked very well because we moved things in containers during the covid crisis we found that it is far cheaper far more environmentally friendly and much quicker actually to move goods through our containers so trains uh, rather than to through through trucks which was the traditional means of uh, transport so there was a lot of uh, uh, i would say benefit there uh, many of our countries uh, maldives mauritius in the beginning of the crisis uh, uh, you recall that prime minister modi had convened a meeting of all south asian leaders and um, this was a very useful opportunity to exchange practices and to see what sort of mutual self help we could give each other Uh, prime minister modi also convened uh, he proposed the g20 convene to 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 discuss the covid crisis saudi arabia that was the president that time responded convened an extraordinary meeting and at that meeting prime minister modi said that he said this is the first time the g20 was meeting on an issue that was not financial or economic in nature he expounded the theory of human centric globalization that means you must today work for the benefit of others so when we talk about working for the global common good i think that has been uh, most important plank of india's foreign policy how can we work for the global common good whether it is vaccines whether it is uh, medicines therapeutics whether it is uh, specialized teams responding to requirements in the maldives mauritius seychelles uh, comoros madagascar mozambique uh, in the covid crisis wake of the covid crisis whether it was uh, through um i would say uh, technical assistance any other way uh, uh coven platform for example where we we've used this platform to successfully administer as i said 220 crore vaccines to our people uh it's a most efficient platform we had a global coven conference 142 countries participated we said you can give it to you you can scale it up you can scale it down many countries actually use that um so Uh, the last point i am making is financial inclusion which is part of that working for the global common good we have found that that financial inclusion uh, through platforms has served most vulnerable sections of our population uh, we are able to administer assistance directly to people in their banks ac- bank accounts we've uh, rooted out the middleman rooted out corruption made it far more efficient 
we've got women uh, more directly involved um, by getting benefits more directly. Uh, and the Prime Minister at Bali, G20 summit in Bali, spoke of the fact that 40% of total digital transactions in the world were through the UPI. In other words, that India is contributing extraordinarily towards a digital economy on a global basis. So we want to take that also to scale to the rest of the world. How can we use our experiences, our achievements to provide identity cards to the 4 billion people in the world who don't have ID cards, provide financial inclusion to uh, those that may need it best. So these are examples of how we intend to work for the global common good, uh, human-centric globalization, fits in with our uh, theme, which is a very traditional, ancient theme of ours, Vasudev Kutumbakam. One Earth, One Family, One Future. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, that was uh, uh, an extraordinary uh, address by Mr. Haringla, and uh, you'll all agree that uh, uh, his address also exhibited uh, uh, all that rich experience that he has had over the decades dealing with the neighborhood. Uh, it's very difficult, by the way, to to come up with such uh, granular detail, but he succeeded in doing that and uh, did great justice to uh, the topic as well. Um, I think uh, you very rightly highlighted the uh, emphasis on uh, infrastructure and connectivity and later rightly brought it back to people to people connect. For a physical connectivity without the people to people connect uh, will only be a glass uh, that is half full, uh, and you succeeded in emphasizing that aspect. But I also think that South Asia now needs to look at uh, certain, creating certain common standards for itself in terms of uh, perhaps uh, uh, welfare of the girl child, nutrition, uh, perhaps education. Uh, these uh, socioeconomic indices um, differ vastly from one South. Asian country, country, country perhaps within a large country like India, of course, there is a certain variance. Uh, is it possible for us, for instance, to develop uh, a common approach to the great crises that we face today on food, fuel, and fertilizers? Is it uh, possible to conceive of uh, a, a new strategic uh, uh, sort of reserves uh, specifically to deal with such crises in our region? We have seen how the fuel crisis, for instance, overtook uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, elsewhere, we have heard, for instance, this morning, a colleague from Myanmar speak about uh, the production of uh, lentils in uh, Myanmar for the Indian market. Uh, but when the uh, you know harvest in India is uh, rather fulsome, uh, the Myanmar uh, Myanmarese uh, lentils are no longer required. Um, and he seemed to suggest that that creates a certain dissonance in in terms of food security or the security of farmers. So is it possible to look beyond borders where we see that our own food security is tied to a certain broader geography than ours? Do we in India also put on our, our thinking uh, uh, caps and, and look uh, at this differently? Uh, so I, I would suggest that we give it a little deeper thought, creating a new uh, integrated approach to food, uh, fuel, fertilizers, and go beyond uh, the themes that we have discussed so far. So thank you very much for that wonderful talk. Uh, uh, it was a, a virtual tour d'horizon, as the French would say, an overview of uh, virtually everything uh, that is uh, important to us in this region on the uh, theme of integration. Um, I actually yearn uh, for the day when uh, all the tourists who come to Nepal will also visit India, and that all the tourists who go to the Maldives will also with our beaches, versa. If that is made possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, by again uh, creating new standards uh, for tourism, for instance, modular standards that will apply in you know both countries across borders, then we will have achieved the kind of integration that seems to exist in Southeast Asia, where people going to Thailand invariably end up in Malaysia or vice versa. Uh, so uh, let us uh, keep that. Uh, as that great hope, uh, we look at it with uh, great optimism as we go along. Uh, may I request you to take a few uh, questions from the floor because that might be 
uh, an interesting way to engage, particularly our guests from South Asia. Uh, so may I request our guests from South Asia to kindly make an observation or raise a point or ask a question of Mr. Harshringla. Much has been said by you and by him. Do I see any hands go up? Yes, please. Mr. Bhandari from Nepal. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Harsh, for your uh, my deep insights. Uh, in the worsening uh, climate change, uh, disaster should, uh, if we uh, talk about sort of a dark side uh, that we will be facing in the near future, uh, so there will be extreme uh, events and the much of the population are already vulnerable and exposed to those climate extremes. Uh, we are not only uh, part of the same climate system, but also uh, we are connected through river systems. Whatever happens in the upstream or the, in the downstream impacts uh, will go through the, uh, those river systems uh, in agriculture, in tourism, uh, in production, in service sector, in production sector. So how uh, India is uh, set up uh, uh, economically uh, powerful, technologically uh, 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 robust country uh, can bring all neighbors together uh, uh, through its uh, uh, set up capacity in dealing with uh, disasters, particularly uh, making uh, communities, governments, uh, and, 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 and regional agencies uh, to cope with those uh, uncertainties. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm, I'm asking uh, some thoughts and solutions from you because uh, there are institutional structures, uh, but not working properly, like SARC Disaster Management Center, uh, Climate Center, uh, and there are many bilateral institutions as well. Uh, so they are also somewhere uh, sort of stuck into uh, either a political interest or something. So uh, what could be uh, the way out uh, to go beyond these barriers, uh, break those silos and uh, sort of go beyond the borders so that uh, sort of coexistence that we have been talking uh, throughout the day would really be uh, existing in practice. Uh, thank you. May I uh, request uh, one more, please? Uh, yes, please do identify yourself. I don't see a nameplate there. Yeah. My name is Mahfuzkur. I'm, I'm from BISS Bangladesh. So I, I, I thank uh, the uh, this, uh, keynote speaker so for his uh, mentioning of Bangladesh for, I think, more than 23 times. And, and we have seen the, the progress in, uh, with, of Bangladesh. Yeah, I mean, he, he was the ambassador to, uh, in High Commission to Bangladesh. So, and then during his tenure, I mean, the, there is a lot of progress in, in terms of economic integration, trade, investment, and other areas. So, and I found that, uh, in fact, in fact, if if we consider the the in fact the numbers of, of trade and investment, so it has gone very well. So, uh, is there any any kind of lessons uh, for the time that we are passing? A tremendously uh, pressing time, and and in the year 2023, and according to the IMF focus, so the three major economic areas like I mean, the European Union, US and China, they, they will be shrinking. So what would be the lesson for, for the this kind of integration, Bangladesh and India, because the, these economies are the two la largest economies in South Asia. So do you see any kind of I mean, lessons that can be learned for, for uh, the other countries of the world? Now that I've taken two let me take one more. Um, yes, please, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Vijayasena from Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Shingla, for that uh, uh, extremely comprehensive uh, set of remarks. Um, my question is, is a brief one, and that is, if we look at uh, the G20 uh, around the year 2009, the global financial crisis kind of gave it a new impetus, even though G20 had existed for about uh, a decade or so before that. Um, and that new impetus uh, and new success, if you will, was because it was able to play a crucial firefighting role in the aftermath of the GFC and bring coordination around central banks to get that response. And I would, uh, I would think that there's a lasting legacy of that 2009-10 kind of period around G20, what it managed to do, 
in terms of coordinating action when there was a failure of coordination. So if you were to point to one thing of this G20 year, uh, among the many things that are there, I think now over the years, the G20 summits have become uh, larger, more number of agendas, naturally as uh, issues have multiplied. But if you had to think of one, looking back, if you were 10 years from now, you had to look back at this 2023 year of presidency, and there was one thing that this year would have a lasting legacy for, what thematic area or issue do you think that would be from an Indian perspective? Thank you. So if you permit, let me uh, respond to what the comments you made, because I think they were very thought provoking in many senses. Uh, the issue of standards, you know, uh, we found that within um, our own neighborhood, uh, we have very differing standards. You know, the BIS has a different standard from the ISI in India, different standards from the Nepal or Sri Lanka standards. Uh, so that is, in many senses, an impediment uh, to those uh, integrations and trade and investments that we speak. Uh, and the free flow of goods is impeded. You know, when you have a different standard, then you have a different gauge. And I think that doesn't help. Uh, so it's a very valid point that we probably need to work on how we can set uh, standards that can be applied across our region, uh, at least for imports and exports and for trade, uh, we should certainly utilize uh, standards that have a certain uh, level of uniformity. Um, and of course, uh, I think the issue of uh, there is a certain interdependence in the uh, commodity trade, for example. I mean, I think Master Chinoy mentioned uh, lentils from Myanmar. Now, um, you know, whether it is onions, whether it is, uh, you know, um, uh, garlic, whether it is any other commodities that are traded across borders with all of our neighbors, uh, you know, there are ups and downs. Uh, when there is a, uh, you know, I would say a shortage of these products, obviously every government takes certain steps and you are entitled to take those by the WTO uh, to restrict exports or to temporarily uh, suspend. For example, right now we have a restriction on the export of wheat. Earlier it was onions. Um, so there is a fluctuation in the international commodity trade. That's a natural process. You once have a lot of sugar from Brazil, another year you have uh, a shortage. Uh, you have uh, other countries coming into the market. So it is not a set market. Uh, what we've tried to do, uh, for, let's take the example of lentils from Myanmar. What we've done is we've concluded an agreement with Myanmar that commits to our buying a certain minimum quantity of lentils irrespective of the fluctuation in the market. And in my view, but this is a very personal view, uh, so don't uh, take it uh, uh, as something which is, uh, which is uh, a government policy, is that we should actually exempt all our neighboring countries from the vicissitudes of uh, export and import uh, restrictions. In other words, uh, if you have an onion crisis in the country, uh, you exempt your immediate neighbors, uh, from any of the restrictions that you impose. So, uh, you, uh, you know, you're exporting to uh, many countries in the world. Yes, you have to have those restrictions, but within your immediate neighborhood, which is part of your trading zone, uh, and, and it, there is an interdependency, I think you should make sure that that is uh, something that we insulate. Uh, this is a debate in our system, and I'm, I'm sure, I think we are getting more and more responsive uh, to some of these uh, concerns. Um, and of course, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, tourism, for example, now look at the G20 process. This is one thing I wanted to say. We expect 100,000 foreign participants to come in in the, in the course of the next eight or nine months into India just for the G20. Now, uh, you know, uh, it's very clear that if you come to India, we are also encouraging them. You come to India, uh, this is an opportunity for us to showcase uh, our uh, cultural heritage, our diversity, our tourism potential. Um, we also say that after your meetings, please feel free to, you know, visit our country. But in doing so, you could also visit our neighboring countries, you know, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, they're all Maldives. All uh, our neighbors can benefit from this, uh, you know, flow of people. And these are people who uh, actually are those who can uh, garner, I mean, they're more influential. They can, I think, uh, get a better sense of the feedback from their experiences and therefore be force multipliers for our tourism economies. But that's just a brief note and, and some you know, very valid points. And 
I, I must point out here that uh, in a system of generalists, uh, we are all from the, you know, being from the Indian Foreign Service, where generalists are encouraged, uh, Ambassador Chunai is uh, a specialist. Uh, he's one of our, uh, I would say, foremost experts uh, on, uh, on uh, China, uh, but also the rest of East Asia. And so from that perspective, uh, I think, uh, you know, his observations in whatever we do are always more pertinent. Thank you so much for, I think we've, we've worked closely together in many areas, but uh, I thought I should say this uh, uh, to those who, many of us are scholars here in many areas. Uh, he is the person we go to even today for anything that is to do with a very specialized uh, focus on our large neighbor. Um, um, the uh, question, of course, uh, I think uh, Bandari Saab uh, asked was on the issue of how can we work together to respond more effectively to climate change uh, um, and natural disasters. And I think that is a very valid point considering that, uh, you know, climate change at one time was going to happen. Today it has happened. We are seeing climate change, the impact of climate change in our daily lives. Um, unseasonal weather, uh, you know, uh, I would say uh, cyclones, uh, earthquakes. Uh, uh, Joshimut has been a lot in the news uh, because of the fact that, the, you know, the ground is breaking up from under this town. Now, we are all living in a very fragile ecosystem, and the Himalayan system is fragile. This is, these are new fold mountains. And so, um, back to our Himalayan belt, uh, Nepal, many of our countries that are more directly impacted, and I think it's very important that we have systems in place. And there are two types of systems. One is uh, preventive systems. How can you take preventive steps? And I think here we are working with uh, the international Solar Alliance, the Coalition for Disaster Infrastructure, to get the international community to work together to create capacities, to deal with, uh, you know, to capacities for solar energy, for how to make houses which are more resilient to, to uh, you know, uh, disasters, natural disasters. I think these are all very important areas. We have found that if a cyclone uh, hits uh, the east coast of India, for example, the cost of rebuilding houses is very, very high. Uh, houses, infrastructure, everything else. How can we make, there is, there is technology available today that can make them resilient to these cyclones. How can we use that technology? The CDRI deals with that. And so we have invited them to be um, a guest member in our presidency. These are areas that I think we need to work more closely on, and there's a lot of scope for cooperation with our neighbors. The other is how to respond to disasters. And in many senses, I think we have, we have in India developed a very a strong response mechanism through the National Disaster Relief Agency Authority. Uh, we've got capacities in place that can uh, enable us to respond very urgently. And we have done that, you know, when there was a pollution crisis in Mauritius, uh, our ships were the first there. When there was a ship, a uh, huge ship that caught fire off the coast of Sri Lanka, we were there. Uh, when there was a <clears throat> cyclone uh, in uh, uh, Bangladesh or Myanmar, we were there. So essentially, when there was a water crisis in Maldives, uh, we, our ships were the first to provide water, drinking water in Maldives. What I'm saying is that uh, we have to be out looking out for each other. We have to ensure that there is mutual, uh, I would say, uh, reinforcement whenever we need it in our neighborhood. We don't have to depend. Uh, I think it's enough that we depend on each other and we make sure that we have the systems in place that can uh, ensure a certain mutual dependency. And that works both ways. And we had the second wave of the COVID crisis. Many of our neighboring countries offered whatever support uh, that was possible under the circumstances, and we got that support. So we need to keep that uh, factor in mind. Um, I think uh, in the uh, current uh, economic context, I think the question was, uh, what can we? What are the lessons uh, that are there for all of us? Uh, as I mentioned, I think. Uh, you know, this uh, crisis is uh, one that uh, countries, you know, you may be far from the epicenter of a crisis or a conflict, but you are equally adversely affected. In other words, the global integrations and interlinkages are so strong that, uh, that you feel uh, the impact of anything that can happen thousands of miles away from you. Uh, and I think uh, every developing country has felt the impact of the Ukraine crisis and you can, Ukraine conflict. And of course, um, uh, it's very important. The first thing I would say again is that we must mutually support each other. That's very important. 
every country is going to go. I mean, whether it's Sri Lanka, whether it's Nepal, it's Maldives, it's uh, ourselves, it's Bangladesh, uh, every country is facing today uh, the pressures of, uh, you know, lowered imports, uh, the, uh, sorry, lowered exports, uh, higher costs of imports, uh, issues of remittances, lower tourism revenues, whatever. I mean, the issues are that uh, the world today is in uh, some level of ferment and uh, uh, markets that normally buy your products, uh, uh, the demand has clearly gone down. So uh, whether it is, uh, you know, your product could be tourism, your product could be garments, your product could be something else, demand for your product has gone down. I was just seeing uh, just this morning that our own exports uh, have uh, come down somewhat. Uh, again, I would say it is because of the lowered demand globally for goods that we normally uh, sell. So, uh, how do we deal with this and how do we ensure we don't go under? Uh, by, by under, I mean we don't allow each other to, to face a crisis. Uh, we, we, we be as supportive as possible. Um, we work closely with Sri Lanka, we continue to work closely with Sri Lanka and I think we need to work with all of our neighbours to reinforce uh, a sense of uh, confidence and solidarity. And at the end of the day, it is confidence. You know, I think, let's put it this way that uh, if, uh, in a certain sense, you can instill uh, confidence by ensuring that there is a backup, uh, if there is a financial crisis and they, you know, people know that there is a, uh, you know, a, a certain guarantee behind your currency or behind that uh, particular, uh, let's say, uh, you know, that, that a loan is available uh, at, at short notice, I think that crisis will fade away. So mostly it's crisis of confidence. It's, it's not that our countries lack anything. We have the resources, we have the means, we have the abilities, but it's a question of confidence and we should be able to reinforce that uh, when the time comes in a manner that is uh, very swift, uh, very effective. Uh, again, this is a personal view, but I think uh, today is a time that within our region, we need to be as uh, supportive and responsive as possible and uh, clearly, um, you know, uh, how we don't know how long the situation will continue and how, what shape it will take, but um, nobody is uh, out of this or immune from this. Uh, and so, um, you know, mutual uh, help is, 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 is always uh, important. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, Mr. Vijay Singh spoke about uh, lasting legacy of our president. See, um, what I did was out of priorities. I, it would be prescient to me if I were to be able to define that lasting legacy. I think this is a process. Um, keep in mind that G20 is not the presidency only initiates and controls the agenda, uh, but it's a consensual process. I mean, you know, you have to go through that process with all of your partners in order to reach outcomes uh, that everybody agrees with. If there's a single uh, participant who, who is not comfortable with that idea, that idea can't go through. And so in our presidency, what we depend on is uh, cooperation and collaboration of our G20 partners. Uh, we depend on extensive consultations, all concerned, and that's been our endeavor. We've had our issues papers distributed very early. Uh, we've had uh, one round of discussions in many of the meetings that have taken place. But uh, whether those will lead to outcomes. Uh, so in terms of broad priorities, I explained what we want to do, uh, whether it is uh, to stimulate growth, uh, maybe, uh, you know, something on the finance track, uh, whether it is uh, SDGs, uh, you know, high principles, whether it's lifestyle for environment, uh, again, uh, these are uh, at the level of principles because the G20 is a normative body. It is not an action-oriented action. I mean, it doesn't result in practical outcomes immediately. It results, it basically is a guidance area. Um, and of course, uh, you can have practical outcomes. We have the debt service suspension initiative that allowed countries uh, a moratorium on repayment of debts during the COVID crisis. Uh, you had the ACT Accelerator program during COVID. So you, you can have some areas, but but what I'm saying is largely it is uh, normative. And, uh, and I think we will certainly look at uh, specific uh, outcomes and specific uh, impact. It doesn't have to be one, it could be several, uh, but it's a process that uh, we are going through. It's not, uh, I mean, if I were to say something and uh, tomorrow, if a uh, few countries are not, uh, you know, with that, then it is, it's not uh, worth uh, putting across. So uh, we should, I think, be slightly cautious in what we put out. Uh, what is important is that we have uh, a very large number of initiatives on the table today. 
and uh, and uh, we do believe that some uh, if not all of them should uh, see the light of day and and i think as i said our prime minister said we should have uh, you know outcome that is that is very very favorable uh, uh, globally and meets the requirements and addresses some of the concerns that are there at a global level um, on that optimistic note, uh, we end our very productive and fruitful uh, day one. We look forward to day two uh, with equal enthusiasm. Uh, and so uh, it remains uh, for me now simply to convey a, a very big thank you to you, Ambassador Harsh Shringla. And Harsh, if I may call you, uh, thank you for being a good friend and, and coming and spending so much time with us and answering all these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. You would all agree that we had a very good first day of the conference. Thank you for your participation today. Let us carry it forward tomorrow at 10 a.m. We request you to be seated by 9.45. Thank you.